e ngā mana, e ngā reo, e ngā iwi, e rauranga tira mā. Nau mai, haere mai, tiki mai. Let's start our hui today with a karakia. Taka, taka te hau ki te uru, taka taka te hau ki te tonga, ki e mā kina kina ki uta, ki e mā tara tara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, e tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Uh, kia ora hui hui mai tātou katoa. Welcome to our webinar today where we explore how we as individuals and organisations can hold ourselves accountable to the communities we operate in and how we build trust with stakeholders. Uh, ko Amanda Re Tuku Ingoa, he mahi an au ka, uh, hei kairangaho ki Bill. Um, I'm Amanda Reed, I'm a senior researcher at Bill, and I'll be guiding our kōrero today. Uh, te mea tūtahi, a little bit of Zoom housekeeping first. We'll be using both the chat and the Q&A functions today. We'd like to encourage you to use the Q&A function to ask questions of our panellists and to look at questions others are asking. If you're also interested in the answer to a question, just hit like and that will help us prioritise when we come to the Q&A portion of our time together. We'd also like to encourage you to use the chat function to comment, add in links, and to ask any technical questions, like if you're having Zoom issues. Um, my colleague Conrad will be monitoring this and we'll be able to help you. Uh, so panellist questions in Q&A and technical questions in kōrero in the chat function. In INA, I'd like to introduce our three panellists, our three thought leaders for today's webinar. So first I'd love to welcome Kate Freitberg. So Kate is an independent philanthropy consultant and a blogger on philanthropy and community issues. She co-founded and chairs Te Mukarau Trust and serves on the Ngaitahu Fund Committee and on the board of the Innovation Unit Australia New Zealand. Previously, Kate was Executive Director of the Todd Foundation and Chair of Philanthropy New Zealand. Kate lives in Pōneke with her husband, the youngest of her three sons, a dog, a cat and several chickens. Kia ora, Kate. Next, Kamini Nui Ki Akwe, Manu Keri. Uh, Manu has Ngati Pukinga, Ngati Haua, Tongan, and Pakia Whakapapa, and lives near the beautiful Ruatoria on the East Coast. He has a background in youth and community development work, evaluation, and social enterprise. He co founded Rua Bioscience, a pharmaceutical company that successfully listed on the NZX in October 2020. Manu has a passion for community-led development and participatory processes, and he is interested in issues of accountability, trust, and transparency in decision-making at all levels of society. Kia ora, Manu. Kia ora. Finally, a warm welcome to Craig Fisher. Craig is a consultant with RSM, specialising in governance, strategy, audit, and assurance advice and a strong interest in sustainability of impactful uh, organisations. He has 30 years of public accountancy experience and is a recognised specialist in the not-for-profit and charitable sector. Craig holds a range of governance roles, it's quite an impressive list, including independent councillor of the Auckland District Law Society, independent risk Assurance and Audit Committee Chair of Ngāti Whātua Awarake, Chair of the External Reporting Advisory Panel of the External Reporting Board, Chair of the Fred Hollows Foundation New Zealand, and a trustee of the Sustainable Coastlines Charitable Trust. He is also a late onset surfer. You can see his beautiful kāinga and whāingaroa there in the background, and grows macadamia nuts, uh, among other passion pursuits. Kia ora, Craig. Kia ora. So when we first started exploring accountability, we were interested in accountability framework beyond bottom uh, lines, beyond financial bottom lines, and in looking at the different ways that organisations are held to account by stakeholders and by communities. 
So we were looking at frameworks and mechanisms like the living wage, social accounting, social license to operate and social impact. Um, so because understanding uh, intergenerational way of being and kaitiaki of our assets and our resources means placing attention on how business activities, outputs and outcomes could be better measured by well-being um, rather than by GDP. But it became clear that we couldn't talk about accountability without talking about trust. So my partai to our uh, thought leaders today is what does accountability mean in your world? I can kick it off, I suppose. Um, I was thinking about that partai and I thought that people who have been entrusted with something generally most times need to be accountable for it. And the only exception I could think of to that rule um, would be in the case of koha or gift, um, where usually there is no expectation of accountability, there's only trust, and perhaps there isn't even trust, there isn't even, you know, in some, some situations there wouldn't even be further thought, it's just a giving with no expectations or um, anything on the, the recipient uh, of that koha or gift. Um, and kohas, uh, thinking about it on the, at the marae, when you put a koha down, you often call it a whakaro, which is sort of a thoughtfulness um, from the giver to the receiver. Um, and so, yeah, there's sort of that um, no expectation of, of accountability, but a, a thought that goes with the, the gift. Um, other than that, yeah, generally, I think where there's um, something that's been entrusted to others, there's a degree of accountability. And I don't think that there's ever absolute accountability and neither is there ever absolute trust. I think maybe financial audits get close to absolute accountability. Uh, <laughs> Craig's shaking his head. Um, but um, yeah, so, and I guess thinking too, there's um, lots of different areas where that, that applies and particularly in um, society with, uh, in the public sphere, it's politicians who are entrusted to make decisions on, on our behalf and a representative democracy um, and, and public servants, bureaucrats uh, are entrusted um, with a degree of responsibility for the well-being of, of public good um, and to some degree the environment. Uh, and in a private sphere, it might be shareholders or um, consumers. In our case with pharmaceuticals, it's patients who um, are entrusting the processes of manufacture that there'll be um, some accountability and quality control and those sort of things. Um, and in the philanthropic world, I guess there's uh, donors uh, who are entrusting their, their funds um, to those who make decisions about how those funds are distributed. And there's the uh, recipients of those funds often in the NGO sector who have a degree of accountability for their how they use those funds on behalf of the beneficiaries or the purpose that, that they're given. Um, so yeah, those are just some sort of quick reflections on how accountability and trust works in my world. Um, and certainly as a public listed company now with Rua Bioscience, there's a lot of uh, accountability on the, the company, on the board and the management and in the listed world, it's every six months. Um, when I was a councillor on Gisborne District Council, it was every three years. And it was interesting, the different philosophies of accountability that politicians have in terms of uh, how much they are accountable to the voters and whether that's only every three years when it comes to election time and that's the only real accountability they have or whether there's um, an obligation to be more accountable on a regular basis um, you know in, in the technologies facilitating greater accountability I think the the online meetings that where we can observe if we can't get them in person provides a greater degree of accountability for the way that issues are discussed and deliberated on um, in the final decisions that are made so that we can see who's making what decisions and what perspective they're bringing to those decisions. Um, but that's still, you know, most decisions happen before the meeting or behind closed doors with officials and those sort of things. So uh, we've still got a way to go before there's greater accountability and transparency at, 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 in those contexts. Oh. Kira Manu and uh, Kira Amanda and, and K 
could have tattooed to everyone who's taken tattoo. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, to everyone who's taken time out of their day to um, to, to, to spend time on um, listening to us because it's a very, very busy time of year. Um, yeah, it, it's really interesting. And I'd like to pick up some of your points, Manu, about who isn't accountable. Because um, Koha is a great example of um, not being accountable for a very good reason. Um, what is accountability? I, I think it's doing the right thing and ensuring you're doing the right thing. But also perhaps acknowledging that mistakes happen and owning up to those mistakes and, and learning from them. Um, my world's a world of funding and the accountability tends to go one way. So funders are often very, usually very interested in um, getting accountability from the organizations they fund, but that doesn't necessarily go the other way. Um, there's not many people who would ask a funder, where does your money come from? How do you invest your assets? Uh, how much are you giving as a portion? Um, those are valid questions, but they're not ones that are uh, asked often because of the power imbalance. So it seems to me that sometimes power, uh, power has a play in accountability. So those who have power, who can say, you know, or else, um, can require accountability of those with less power. So I'm really interested in how we can make things more reciprocal. Um, another great example of lack of accountability perhaps is the big tech companies. So your Facebooks and your Googles, who, who holds them to account? Yeah, really interesting points there. Kia ora tātou te whanau. Um, I'm, I guess, interested in this concept and that when Amanda asked me to uh, be on this panel, I thought about the fact that, gosh, I've spent 30 years as a professional actually dealing with accountability and trust, and I've never really sat back and thought about it uh, and the relationship between those things. Um, you know, we're talking here about trust, which is a, an emotional response or reaction, um, and how do we get trust in something? Uh, we get trust um, by showing accountability uh, in the European Pakeha concept, we um, set standards for things, we write laws. Um, that's what uh, Manu has to comply with in terms of his annual reporting and his six monthly reporting, <laughs> his listed company now. Um, and we do that around a, uh, you know, a very defined framework, but it's only ever been, a, I think, a reasonably narrow framework. Um, and if I think of accounting standards, we're just writing standards for, you know, which side does the money go on? Um, and then we write legislation to say that uh, if you are this sort of entity, you need to be transparent in order to promote trust and confidence. Uh, and we've got, you know, the, the trust and confidence for investors to invest, the, the trust and confidence in the charity sector for donors to donate, uh, the trust and confidence in government that their money, well, they're spending our money collectively wisely. Um, and, and I find that quite sort of an interesting, interesting concept when um, really at the end of it, trust is actually quite a nebulous thing. It's almost a feeling. <laughs> um, but we set standards to try and get consistency. We set standards to try and have um, general understanding of something uh, and comparability of something. Um, I've spent most of my professional life as an auditor, so the professional skeptic uh, coming in to try and provide an independent assessment of things to hopefully add to some trust and confidence. Um, but I do sometimes wonder if, if that actually achieves the end aim. Um, I'm really interested in terms of how we can better measure trust. Um, I, I know since DIA Charities uh, was established, they have um, each year tried to do a survey of is there greater trust and confidence in the charitable sector or less than the year before. And that's really one of their measures of success is that uh, as a regulator of the charity sector, they're there to help promote trust and confidence. Um, and yet, uh, how do we measure that trust uh, we basically just measure it on a on a feeling. Do I feel like I trust charities or not? Um, so yeah, I find that that quite interesting. You know, what's what's the the trust in the commercial sector? Uh, well, I guess in in Manu's world with Rua, 
bioscience, it's going to be your share price money. <laughs> if that's holding up, then people are, are trusting what you're doing. Um, trust in the government, it's votes for them, I guess. Um, yeah. But it is interesting that there's not many uh, general measures. Uh, there's that thing called the, Eid is it the Eidelman Trust Barometer that comes out once a year. Um, but other than that, I'm not aware of many um, general measures uh, out there that are trying to assess trust. I was thinking as you were talking, Craig, about a friend of mine from um, Nepal, actually, and he, he came over here and did his PhD um, on sort of peace and conflict studies and things after the civil war there. And, um, and their public institutions and private are um, yeah, not in great shape. And um, he was amazed at just the, the way that society functioned in New Zealand and um, and asked how we got here, and I didn't really have a great answer for that. Um, but it was, in, you know, thinking about that and the level of trust in the social contract, I suppose, that exists in our society and the um, annual measures that they do of nation states around the world and how New Zealand continually comes out in the top three um, most transparent. Um, I think I was thinking transparency probably has a, a lot to do with trust and accountability as well. And for whatever reason, um, we're certainly far from perfect, and I think the bar's really low for us to still come out in the top three every year, but um, we've obviously got some um, systems in place that pro provide some transparency in our access to politicians and public servants and, um, and the, the lack of, um, or the, the relatively low level of corruption in the private sector compared to other jurisdictions. Um, I hope, you know, sort of, puts us in a, into that, that category. But as I say, I think it's a, a fairly low bar and we've got a long way to go in, in many areas. Yeah, I think it's fantastic that we are where we are, but it's something we also need to vigorously protect uh, to make sure that there is adequate transparency uh, so that people can see what's there. I, I'm, I find it interesting in my charity's work, uh, I sometimes, uh, take a lot of criticism from charities in terms of why do we have to do this compliance? Why do we have to do a set of annual accounts and follow accounting standards? Um, and, and to me, it's just tickets to the game. If you want the trust of the general public, um, then the general public should be protected by a requirement for the charity to be transparent in what it's doing. Um, and, and I understand that there's a balance there in terms of the compliance cost of being transparent, uh, and, and that's always quite challenging. I think also that uh, it's getting possibly more challenging in some respects in that uh, in order to trust an organisation, people now want to know a lot more about that organisation. Um, the group of stakeholders has got much wider, uh, and I guess the, you know, the, the the purest example of that is the company situation, whereas previously companies just used to put out financial metrics uh, and that was it, and that was enough. And if they, if they were making money and they had a good balance sheet, well, that was good. They got voted successfully in their share price. Um, but now the, the social license of a company uh, is as important as that. And you know, in some sectors, I'd suggest that the social license to operate is actually more important um, than the financial situation. So. Um, you know, we've got a really interesting trend, I think, in terms of more information being demanded by a greater group of stakeholders, um, not all of whom are equal <laughs> um, in, in relation to the organisation. Um, and, and we've got that happening in all three sectors. We've got that um, in the, the commercial world where, you know, in the company situation, um, a concept like integrated reporting is growing and then really integrated reporting is trying to show your holistic strategy as an organization and the fact that you don't just make money but you also employ people and what impact that has and what your impact on the environment is and, and all of those things so that you can show a, a sustainable organization um, we've tried to do a similar sort of thing by legislating in the charity sector for a service performance reporting so we've tried to um, 
legislate that charities will actually answer a couple of really core cool questions like why, who are you and why do you exist and what did you set out to do and what did you actually achieve before we get to the finances. Um, but that's really hard. It's hard to do that because it's different for every organisation and there's no, um, yes, there's a standard around service performance reporting, but actually it's a really principles-based standard and um, uh, you know, a lot of people are looking for the template and looking for the answer. Um, and then we've got the government uh, with you know, more of a move towards the living standards framework, which I think is fantastic, looking at a, a more holistic view in terms of setting policy um, and you know, having a well-being budget. Um, all of the things which I, I see as being done to um, hopefully engender more trust and confidence in these institutions. Um, but I also see a huge amount of challenge and complexity and what are the right things to communicate and how much should we communicate and, and how should we communicate that to, um, to actually engender that ongoing trust and confidence. One of the things I'm really interested in is I hear you, Kōrero, when we're talking about transparency and power dynamics and uh, imbalances and, and uh, across the different sectors, like how does an organisation know who they're accountable to? Because we've got, you know, stakeholders with social licence um, and, and we've got charities with their beneficiaries and also funders. Uh, government with with everyone in the country but like how do you know if you're in an organization who you're accountable to I think that's a really interesting question and I think the people that we uh, the first thought that comes in our head as to who we're accountable to might not necessarily be the most important person to be accountable to so I'm thinking for example of um, a for-purpose organisation who has to be accountable to the funder. Well, actually, that's not the most important stakeholder to be accountable to. The most important stakeholder to be accountable to is the community that you're set up to serve. Um, but the community you're set up to serve doesn't necessarily have the power to demand that accountability of you. So I'm not sure how you get around some of, some of these things. Um, and maybe it's just having a really honest think about, you know, why, why are we here? What are we, uh, what are we trying to do? And who is the 360 degree um, uh, stakeholders that we're, we're accountable to? And some of them might not be very, very obvious at all, like, you know, um, future generations. Um, and maybe, maybe some of this sort of depends on, you know, which hat you're talking about accountability with. So. Are you talking about your accountability for me as a funder or for me as a consultant or for me as a as a human um, and maybe that last one is the most important um, you know are we in our everyday life doing the things that are, are going to make our world a better place for us for our planet and for future generations As you were talking, I was thinking about in our community, there's certainly a sense of an accountability to past generations as well and to, um, to honouring um, things that are important to hold on to, um, which gets here. Yeah, um, you know, when you go into the whareinui, um, into the meeting house, and all the photos of the tifuna, the ancestors are, are looking down on you, you certainly have a sense of actually yeah, there's still a strong... Um, obligation to uh, protect those things that those people um, thought were important as much as what we think are important today and, and for future generations as much as we can, can know of them. Um, and it's also beyond people as well, it's the, to the natural world and, um, and how do we make ourselves accountable to non-human uh, stakeholders in our activities um, and I guess some of the ESG, the environmental reporting um, frameworks that are being developed can provide a degree of that. Sometimes it might be setting up an entity who's got human representatives on behalf of um, a Taonga species or a, um, a, a river or a, a, yeah, um, native plants and organisms and, and so on. So I guess yeah, we've got to be creative and 
in as Craig said, go well beyond the financials and in those areas. Yeah, I think it's got a lot harder. You know, it used to be um, quite simple in some respects. Uh, and you look at things like company law. You know, who's a, who's a director responsible to? Who's responsible to the shareholders and that sort of thing. Um, but now, you know, we all appreciate uh, that um, in order to operate, you need to be much more cognizant of a wider group of stakeholders. And then it does pose that really interesting question, Amanda, doesn't it, in terms of who are those stakeholders? I've um, been a bit of a thorn in some of the organisations that I've been in and that I've um, been lobbying for stakeholder mapping. Um, and actually, it's a, it's a really interesting exercise to, you know, get a big whiteboard and go, right, who's who in our zoo? Um, you know, and, and it's interesting because the deeper that you go into it, the more complex you realise it actually is in terms of the different relationships that any organisation will have. Um, but I have found it really useful to almost sort of think of it at a concentric circles concept in terms of who are you directly related to and then who you know might be a little bit less directly and a little bit less directly again. Um, and by going through that process of trying to work out, you know, who are your key relationships as an organisation, um, it can allow you to be a lot more uh, deliberate. Um, about considering them and then hopefully deliberate about communicating to them. Um, uh, yeah, no, so I think it's a, a really useful exercise to try and go through some form of stakeholder mapping. Fantastic from a, a strategic point of view of any organisation, you know, can catch a breath and um, actually have a look at their strategy and sit back. Um, it can be very valuable, I think. I think it's interesting in the public and just to, to, sorry, you go, okay. No, you go. Yeah. I was thinking of the public sector where public servants, bureaucrats and officials are generally, particularly in central government, accountable to their minister and answerable that way up. Um, and while we call them public servants, it sort of has to go through the minister's office before it gets to the public. And um, I wonder if there's some examples of um, breaking down some of that hierarchy and, and making those public servants more accountable to the communities that they're intended to serve beyond whatever the, the politicians and the policies of the day are understanding that those ministers like to have control and, and be seen to be doing the good things and when it comes to the not so great things <laughs> they quickly blame the bureaucrats um so if there's yeah sort of examples that people can share of it um happening it would be great to to see i don't know how we get away from it um and i guess different political parties and in generations over time will have different philosophies around how much power and control and accountability the minister demands versus how much the public servants can serve the public beyond whatever the political masters are, are saying they should or shouldn't be doing. I was just thinking about the conversation we had before about um, trust and measuring whether we're trusted um, and then pulling in your thoughts, Craig, about uh, stakeholder mapping. Um, it's maybe it's easier to measure whether we're trustworthy than it is to measure whether we're trusted. Um, and maybe it would be a useful exercise, even if it's an internal one only, to go through our stakeholders and what we do, and just and have a really honest um, think about well, yeah. Are we trustworthy? Are we trustworthy to deliver well to our clients and our the people we serve? Are we are we trustworthy as a treaty partner? Are we trust trustworthy in you know, how we manage assets? Um, yeah, just a thought. Yeah. Interesting thought. Yeah, thanks for that thought, Kate, because one of the things that I'm curious about is that, you know, at this point, we've started off talking quite, um, I guess, outward looking. It's like, here we are as an organisation with stakeholders, and how do they, you know, what's our relationship with them? But we have stakeholders internally as well. We have our employees, and we have cultures and processes and policies that are internal. So what's the relationship? between internal accountability and trust 
in external accountability and trust? How does what we do as an organisation or within our organisations flow out then to our relationships with stakeholders? So it's beyond, uh, you know, formal reporting. Oh, I think that's a really interesting concept. And, and I'd just also add to the, the stakeholder mapping concept that you know, not all stakeholders are created equal. Uh, and I've seen a few organisations come a bit unstuck by going through a stakeholder mapping exercise and realising that they've got a whole lot of stakeholders that they haven't perhaps attended to previously, but then tending to them too much and losing sight of their primary stakeholders. Because so I think you have got, if you think of it as concentric circles, you have got primary and then you moved. Um, my personal view on what you've just posited there, Amanda, is that unless an organisation can be true to themselves, they can't hope to be true to anyone else. Uh, and it's like, you know, your individual ethics, unless you can uh, sleep at night and look at yourself in the mirror and be absolutely happy with what you've done, um, you're not going to do good by others. Um, so I think that um, living the values that the organisation has internally will uh, show that externally. Uh, and I know that's something as an organisation, you know, someone who's worked in an organisation that's employed lots of people in the past, that's always been a, a really big thing in our professional team training is um, absolutely making sure there's really strong core ethics uh, in place. Otherwise, um, that's going to bleed out. Yeah, we've, we've been discussing that uh, in the company recently, you know, we have a set of values that are, you know, fairly generic, but ones that um, we espouse publicly. And the question is, how do we measure our internal performance and adherence to those values in the way that we look after each other and, and um, behave, you know, within the hierarchy of the company or within the relationships that we have um, with uh, suppliers or with um, uh, you know research partners or uh, the relationship between the board and the management and management and the rest of the staff and so on so uh, developing measures which you know you don't have to measure everything in the world but it can be a helpful way of moving beyond just these are values that we we aspire to but we don't actually know whether we're living them or not um, developing some what does it look like on the ground and challenging those and, and reviewing those measures on a regular basis to say, are they accurate and useful um, for telling ourselves whether we are being true to those things that we say we were supposed to be about? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big champion of, of values um, lived in, internally in the organisation and externally. Um, I think sometimes we sort of go through some strategic planning and we sort of say, oh yes, integrity and excellence and da 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 da, and then we, we never drill down onto, into what they mean. So I think if we if we are very intentional about values, not only the words, but how those translate into behaviours, like the, so that each value has a set of behaviours associated with it, which you can then use, you can use in the boardroom to say, well, actually, no, um, I don't think that was um, giving a fair chance to X because we value fairness or whatever it might be. Um, they're only useful, I think, if they're applied um, and applied internally and externally. Yeah, so in terms of being accountable internally as well as externally, um, I think values are a really nice way of just weaving all of those things together. I know when, when my first career was in IT and my husband and I had a had an internet company way back. Um, the, our, our sort of business mantra was to look after your staff and look after your clients and then everything else kind of falls and seems to fall into place, um, which is sort of a, a, a kind of a really simple you know, look internally and look externally and, and, and value your people. Someone once said to me, you should be able to make friends from business and make business from friends. <laughs> That's the, the true sign of being an ethical operator. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, I'd also add with my accountant's black hat on that Enron was um, lauded for their values, <laughs> um, which obviously looked really nice on the wall and to MBA students, but um, some would say they didn't live them, <laughs> obviously. 
um, the biggest corporate collapse in, in history. I was actually listening to a podcast the other day about how the Enron email database has been used uh, to inform, like as, as a deep data source to inform things like looking for terrorists because it, uh, it's quite an innocuous database, thousands and thousands of emails. Um, I guess flowing, flowing on from that, like uh, we talked about business values, organisational values, um, and thinking about values and kaupapa or your purpose of your organisation, how does accountability and trust flow into decision making from, uh, from kaupapa, from your purpose and from your values? Uh, I'll kick off. I, I think it's um, really important, firstly, to be laser-like clear on what your purpose is. And I see a lot of organisations that actually can't articulate that very clearly. Uh, and if that's the case, it's then very hard to measure or to demonstrate um, what you're doing. Uh, so I think that's a really big thing. And, and that's that challenge is being borne out, I think, in the, the growth of impact reporting uh, or service performance reporting or whatever else you, you want to, to label that by. But I think impact reporting is quite a good blanket term. Um, a lot of organisations are really grappling with how do they report their impact. Um, and often that grapple stems back to, well, are you really clear on what it is that you're doing and what you're doing it for? So I think if you can get clearer on those basics, like why do we exist and what's our theory of change? What are we, what are we doing towards that purpose? Um, it will be much easier to report on that and through reporting on that, give people confidence in what it is that you're actually doing. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on that. I think there's two really important questions that you know, we should be asking on a daily basis in our, in our organizations. And one is, uh, if we have a choice, which of these, these two things or three things is going to um, make a greatest contribution to our vision for the world. So you know, a vision statement should be a tool which is used every day. Um, and the other really important question to ask is, you know, what's the right thing to do here? Or sometimes, and a tricky decision that might be, well, what's the most right of, of, or occasionally it might even be what's the least wrong. But uh, being laser-like clear, as you say, um, Craig, about what our, what our mission and vision is and using it on a daily basis and also just constantly asking ourselves, what's the right thing to do? I think those uh, are really helpful for Kaupapa and accountability. Mm. With, with our company, we, um, my co-founder and I, we, you know, our purpose in setting it up was to create jobs and economic opportunities for the, the East Coast and the Ruatoria community where we live. Um, and we went out to the community and asked them to support that um, vision and cope up and purpose. And they did. They opened their uh, wallets and bank accounts and contributed um, funds to begin with. Um, and we went out to other um, potential investors and asked them to also um, help us. And we explained that part of our purpose was still around job creation and so forth. And um, then we went out to institutions and big funds and uh, eventually to the public markets and um, have tried to ensure that that purpose remains at, in the DNA of the company and, um, and that investors know that it's not just about uh, financial returns on their investment, but there's a social impact that this company is committed to, and um, and it's being tested, uh, you know, in our own reviewing our vision statements and um, goals and priorities and things. We constantly um, have to go back, and I've been so proud of our board that you know that they went the co they went the founders um, and our management team and, and others that have come around. Um, we feel like we're st we're still having integrity to those shareholders. We've still got a profit motive, but there's this. Um, social mission that remains at the, the core of the company and so I think it's again it goes back to transparency and when we've gone out to shareholders we've made it very clear that this is part of the purpose and um, and as our shareholder base grows to thousands of people it's um, 
it's going to be harder perhaps but um, provided we continue to communicate clearly and um, and report on those things then it just becomes the norm and, and that's what people expect and uh, it's great to have those investors and um, people that that have enabled that you know that in the end that, that kept the accountability for those original goals of job creation and economic opportunities is definitely there in the local shareholders who put their money in originally but it's also there um, in, in those latter shareholders um, who will be asking for reporting on that at AGM time and then six monthly reports so that it's, it's not just the return the financial return on investment but the, the social return that they're expecting as well. Uh, we've got a lot of really juicy questions that are coming up from uh, from our um, attendees, our participants today. So I was wondering if I could just start to lob some at you. I've got a great one here from uh, Sue, which I think is in your part, ballpark, Craig. Uh, what part does impact reporting play in accountability and trust? Some of the impacts are quite hard to measure. <laughs> Great question. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> um, I think impact reporting plays a huge part and will play an increasing part going forward. Um, you know, in the past, we've tended to measure things, uh, and if I look at my own profession, accounting profession, uh, things that are easy to measure. Um, we have, haven't really grappled with a lot of the really hard things to measure. <laughs> Um, that's why, you know, it's often easy to measure something in accounting terms uh, in terms of what does it cost you from a financial perspective, but perhaps not what the true financial cost of that particular thing actually is. Um, so I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that um, it's really hard to measure a lot of impact. Um, and it's, a, it's an evolving thing as well, but I think that um, it is increasingly important to spend the time doing the hard mahi, trying to, to get better at that. Um, it's, it's interesting if you look at the counting standards. So accounting standards are being pulled at the moment to try and cover a lot more things than accounting. Um, and yet uh, the, the accounting standard setters internationally are these big, uh, international committees and structures that are sort of like slow lumbering um, and it's, it's really hard to um, you know get change uh, in fact I was on a international call yesterday um, looking at um, sustainability reporting and whether a particular body should set new standards for sustainability uh, and there's already heaps of sustainability standards out there and um, they were coming to the conclusion uh, on this international call that they probably should uh, and then they were talking about a five-year time frame to get the standard developed and issued and I just thought wow from a consumer point of view um, I suspect that most consumers want to know whether an organization is being sustainable now not in five years time so maybe rather than waiting for the standards, um, the organisation should be the one grappling with it in terms of how to report and, and how to better communicate. Um, so yeah, you're right. Um, it's really hard to measure impacts, but I think it's critically important and I think it will become even more important moving forward. I think too, there's specialists now in particular areas, whether it's um, emissions, accounting, you know, carbon, um, audits and those sort of things or um, social impact or diversity and governance and, and things that um, that we can pay for in the same way that we pay for um, financial auditors to come and do our accounts. Um, these other auditors uh, who are independent um, and who know the standards and um, uh, yeah, don't have to take as much time as we would if we were inventing them to begin with uh, are available. So. It's about uh, organisations committing the budget, not just the time, but you know, it's a hassle, as all audits are um, internally. Um, but it's, and it, it comes with a cost. But if the expectation there and the demands are there from the stakeholders, then we're going to have to do more of that, as Craig says. Personally, I have a love-hate relationship with impact reporting. Um, <laughs> I, I love the fact that we are really turning our attention to are we actually making the, the difference that we want to make and we have to be doing that. 
what I hate though is it can sometimes be kind of a tool well there's a few things actually number one um, there's a, a phrase those with the data get the money and those with the money get the data so you have to be a certain to, to really do good evaluation um, and impact measurement that's actually not a cheap exercise as money's just said so it makes it really hard for a grassroots organization um, potentially to, um, to compete with the big players um, also as I think also mentioned it's some things are really hard to measure and how do you how do you change that might take 30 years um, but your funder might want the impact measured next year and if you don't they don't receive it well you're out of funding and there's a third thing which I kind of have problems with is that often it's um, impact measurement is associated with do you get funding or not which means there's a very strong incentive to uh, pick the good measures um, some people talk about success theater and vanity metrics um, because if you can kind of crack the nut of looking really cool uh, you're going to get funding uh, which actually might not be the same as doing amazing things in your community so yeah impact uh, reporting is really important but let's not pretend that it's a simple thing that yeah you just dip in the, the data and out comes the answer. This is something which requires um, requires a grain, a grain of salt. It requires us to understand that actually the important part of it is not the data, but what we do with it. It's actually a learning tool. It's a learning tool for us to be uh, getting better at what we do, how we serve our communities. Great point, Caves. Um, I'm just thinking in, in New Zealand we've developed an assurance standard on service performance reporting so this is the reporting that charities have to do which is is a form of impact reporting um, and one of the hardest things about developing that assurance standard has been um, providing guidance direction to auditors to be able to call out people just cherry picking so um, I'll just report on the good stuff this year and oops, we didn't do so well in this particular area. So let's not report on that this year. Um, and that's actually really challenging in terms of well, what are the right things to report and then the, the fairness and the balance of that reporting. Um, so yeah, it's, and it's already posing quite a challenge actually for some auditors who are getting their heads around it and, and starting to face these issues with people very motivated and very concerned from a funding perspective just to report what they believe are the right results, um, the results that will appeal to their funders and therefore um, enable them to get more funding. And maybe that's actually a useful thing to, to pick up on because when the, the statement of service performance I think is a brilliant thing um, if it's used well because it, it allows you to say yes this is what this is what we're trying to do, this is what we did, um, this is what worked and actually this is what didn't work and from a funder's perspective it's actually really refreshing to um, see organizations who are saying well you know these things are fantastic these things are going to require working on next year so so maybe maybe we need to let go of the thought that we actually have to appear to be perfect maybe it's better yeah. to um, be honest about the learning process it can be a big barrier to innovation as well and particularly in social development circles if your future funding depends on positive outcomes um, you don't tend to take risks with new ways of doing things so we keep doing what we've always done and in very uh, few times are the supposed beneficiaries of the services actually involved in uh, the reporting and accountability and for good reason we don't want to stigmatize them further and and so forth but it's, it's a really challenging to um, yeah, work out what contribution we are making to positive outcomes in a, in a whole community beyond just individuals as well. It's, it's ironic this fear isn't it when we all know that we learn more from failure than we do from success. Um, you know you, you remember your failures because they hurt <laughs> and you hopefully uh, learn from that and yet we don't like to report it. <laughs> I'm always so impressed when you do see organizations that are really honest and say, this is what we set out to do and why, and it didn't work, but 
we've learned this from it. Um, I just think that's so refreshing and valuable and educative, um, but it's rare also. I wonder if it's because often uh, things are funded uh, on, on their successful outcomes um, as opposed to on their trialing. Um, but I wanted, there's a question here that I, um, that I wanted to, to put to you, Kate, uh, from Andrew. Many funders develop their own set of criteria for organisations, for grants, etc., but aren't connected at all with the community stakeholders. How do we start to fix that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that's one of the paradoxes of the funding world is that the people who have the money or look after the money are almost uh, very often a bit disconnected with the need that you'd be trying to serve. Um, there's a growing understanding in the philanthropic world that we should be um, a representative of the communities we serve. Um, so there's much more um, concern about you know, who's on your board, um, who's on your staff. It's got a long way to go. Um, so how can you encourage that more? Um, yeah, it, it's really good to give funders feedback. I know it's not always easy, um, but if you can give, give your funder feedback about um, uh, yeah, making sure that, that, that there is appropriate representation uh, and appropriate um, understanding, I think that's really good. Another thing perhaps is to offer to help educate, um, you know, so come on out to our place, come and, come and meet our communities, come and stay at Amarai. Um, I think anything that starts to break down the, the, the bubbles, the, the divides we have, I think is, is really good. So as an example, I'm, um, one of the projects I'm working on currently is with Weasley Community Action here in Wellington. And we're experimenting with what we call, we're calling a circle of doers and donors making change together. So the idea is that you get a bunch of donors and a bunch of community-led projects and um, the funding is it's a shared pool of funding which is decided together um, in the same room, you know, out in Waitangirua, outside, outside the ivory towers. Um, so, yeah, there the, are the, the ways of breaking down these barriers um, and anything we can do that does that, I think, is a really good thing. I think it's good practice for funders to fund, um, I don't know if you call it evaluation or some sort of way of having the voice of the uh, intended beneficiaries uh, feeding back to the um, the source of the, the funding um, because often you get the funder and the fundee being a community group in this sort of codependent relationship you know sort of relying on each other the funder needs good news stories to put in their annual report and the fundee <laughs> needs the funds and um, and so they sometimes look after each other unintentionally I think in the voice of those who are actually supposed to be benefiting from the services and projects um, gets missed out and or that you know only you get the, the really successful stories the easy wins um, rather than those who you know, the, the masses who may not have um, had a had a great time with the, the project and so on so having really good uh, independent where possible but also internally developing those um, capabilities in the projects and in organizations to, to bring the voice of those that it's intended for um, in an honest way through is really important uh, and there's lots of lots of ways of doing that and there's a bit there's always a big debate I see someone just popped up a question there in terms of you know who should fund that evaluation um, my thinking is actually it's not a funder's responsibility and it's not an entity's responsibility it's actually should be both of their responsibility because they both have things to gain about that. And um, I've commonly heard the complaint, oh, funders want this, but they don't fund it. Um, but you know, to me, I, I do wonder sometimes with those entities, whether they're actively looking at how they can evaluate themselves and are they actually evaluating themselves? Uh, you know, I think it's the, 
one of the most powerful things that any organization can do is to have that strategy session every year where you take a really cold, hard look in the mirror um, and ask yourself some painful questions as an organization. Um, you know, even like, are we actually meeting our purpose? <laughs> Should we still be here? <laughs> um, and, you know, if an organization is doing that, then they will probably go some path towards actually their own evaluation um, as well. So yeah, a, a, more of a, a partnership arrangement in that I think would be useful. I've got a really juicy question here that I'm uh, going to, to put to you all, um, but perhaps start with you, Manu. It's from Demi. Um, she's, she was interested in the, the, the corridor that you were saying about future generations, Kate. Um, so we talk about sustainable land management a lot across environment focused agencies. Our interventions to help with that are usually for how long we have funding for rather than how long we have land for or who will use that land in the future. Māori, for example, have a hundred year view of their land, while well, some iwi it's uh, 500 or 1,000. Um, and yet our policies to support their aspirations on looking after their land really do not offer such a view. It's also the case with climate change adaptation, where we talk about resilience to climate change, but without a view of supporting future generations to be resilient. Um, so it's, it's more kind of like, a, what are your views in this, uh, on this topic? Yeah, it's a great... Um... Great question, and I guess it's um, we can only do what what we can. We're not going to be able to solve all of these issues that are intergenerational, and and it's about incremental um, change and building capability and capacity. So I think those are still measurable impacts that we can do in building capability in communities to take care of those issues and and being optimistic and hopeful, but also intentional about um, building on the um, success and failure of the previous generation. So um, not taking all responsibility for it, but doing what we can uh, with what we've what we've got. But certainly, yeah, there's um, some massive issues there. I think about the erosion issues in our part of the country that are just, there's lots of, you know, there's been planting of trees for 20 years, 30 years, and, um, and that doesn't, you know, in many cases, the particularly the pine, forests now are causing as much problem as um, the bare land was yeah. so uh, when we clear fell them um, so there's these unintended consequences and into each generation is going to have to deal with the, the issues that the last one left for them but hopefully we're, we're learning along the way and, uh, and sometimes oh, yeah. the learning and the, the research that can be done and shared to um, you know that's as important as the actual action on the ground um, but we're you know we're actively looking at ways to address what we can, but some of those problems are not humanly possible. There's gullies that are just, there's no way to control them anymore, and they're just going to keep going until the whole hillside's washed out into the, the ocean. Um, and all we can do is find those that are with, you know, where there's some still hope of, of saving that, that gully and um, get the best technology to, uh, that we know of to do what we can with the best resources and varieties of plants to, to try and hold it back um, and put the incentives in place, I guess the financial incentives and, and in some ways carbon offsetting is a bit of a godsend where there's becomes a financial opportunity for landowners to um, take action because there's a financial return. It's not just about retiring what was a productive uh, piece of land and farming or forestry to uh, permanent um, cover and um, and there's a way of creating, you know, financial opportunity for at least for the next couple of generations uh, through carbon credits. Um, so I think, you know, there are some of those financial incentives that we can put in place uh, as well. But yeah, some big issues that I don't have any answers to, but um, some smart people are working on them. I think it's a really interesting challenge, that one, in terms of the the entity that is the kaitiaki, the entity that is the steward that's doing the, the mahi there that's not getting funded for the long term, um, they're the ones that have to hold on to that long term view absolutely tightly and consistently. 
Um, and, I, and I love the Te Ao Māori perspective of you know, having a, a representative of your mokapuna's mokapuna. <laughs> um, and that's their one role. Their one role is to present that voice and remind everybody when everyone else forgets that voice. Um, and I think that's really powerful. And, and if an organisation can do that well internally, hopefully it can amplify that voice to funders and actually get them to see the value of that as well. Um, you know, we're always going to be stuck in short-term funding cycles. Um, you know, we live in a three-year electoral, electoral cycle, which is, is madness, you know, in terms of trying to fund long-term generational issues. Um, but it, it takes the, the kaitiaki to be that voice, to actually keep, um, keep delivering that message of the need for the long-term uh, until they're absolutely bored with the message, but they just need to keep consistently doing it uh, in order for that message to be heard. One of the, the positive initiatives in the last few years was the Land and Water Forum. And while it didn't succeed in many, many ways, what it did show was that providing a deliberative process where different interest groups come together and have to try and understand each other um, and getting everyone around the table can be an effective way to move forward as a community. I'm thinking about, and that's sort of worked its way down to catchment level um, groups where we're trying to bring together uh, farmers and foresters and kaitaki groups um, to, to understand each other's perspectives and try and, and find a common ground and, and move forward together. So our society doesn't tend to do that deliberation very well and bring together and often competing interest groups in a safe way, whether it's race relations issues or economic and environmental issues. Um, often we're you know, at loggerheads with each other and the farmers won't talk to the environmentalists or vice versa. But if we can create safe spaces for people to have the dialogue, um, we can actually see some, some real progress in politics as much as in uh, economics and business and environmental protection. Yeah, it's a tricky, it's, gosh, I, I'm a pretty positive person generally, but, you know, when I think of climate change and their outlook, you know, 200 years for our mokapuna's mokapuna, it's, there's some, it seems to me we need to completely rethink how we live and our relationship with, with Papadunu and Mother, Mother Earth. Um, there's too many of us consuming too much but that's the whole basis of our economic paradigm. So changing that, you know, it's gonna be difficult for a government to be elected on the basis of, um, oh, let's, let's consume less, let's have less economic growth, let's have, let's have fewer jobs. I mean, these are just difficult, difficult things. Um, I think it's up to us, I guess, as people um, to be, to be that voice that you know that that our relationship with the earth matters hugely, and um, our long term survival depends on actually changing how we live. I'm trying to find something that's not so big and juicy for our last few minutes together. Um, but I guess one of the one of the questions that we've got here um, uh, from Tessa Ho, um, who's asked, is there's any research on philanthropy which simply gives support to not for profits in a range of service, um, in uh, it says in philanthropy which has a defined purpose and define the changes they wish to achieve. I guess it's more around the the research. Is there philanthropy that supports a wider range of services as opposed to um, like an outcome. Like do any philanthropic organizations fund someone to do good impact reporting? Um, there is, uh, just off the top of my head, that there's a DIA um, research fund, which I understand is often undersubscribed, um, which is not always a case for, um, for funding pools. Um, yeah, the, the joke goes, if you've seen one funder, you've seen one funder, because <laughs> every funder's um, different. 
Um, but yes, there, there's there's many funders who will fund research and there's very many funders who will um, help with impact um, reporting. Um, and there's quite a few who won't. So it's probably just a case of finding the ones which are a good fit to you. I think we've seen a trend recently with some of the more mature and enlightened funders, thinking particularly of Todd and uh, Tyndall and J.R. McKenzie to um, have a much more trusting relationship with the groups that they're funding and to the point of some of them not even having a reporting, a formal sort of written reporting process, but more of a verbal catch up. Um, and that's required them to do much more due diligence on who they are giving money to, I think, and um, in the, the demonstration of the, um, the value in supporting them often coming from the community itself rather than a, a particular organisation applying for funding in the traditional sense. So I think we're shifting there. And I, I do think back to when I was managing government contracts at MSD and we had this high trust uh, model of... Um, of funding and, and giving larger organisations less accountability in, in some ways that I'm not convinced actually delivered better outcomes that reduced compliance and perhaps put more funds to the front line, but it, did, it didn't necessarily address inadequacies or poor performance and things that just allowed them to do more of that. Um, so there's those trade-offs when there are higher trust uh, relationships in place that you can, yeah, um, you've got to be really, really sure of whether who you're giving it to that are worthy of that that trust. And that's built up over time and funders and fundees need to go on journeys together and build that trust that doesn't happen overnight. I just wanted to add it a wee bit, add to um, that money, because um, you mentioned there about um, what's called roundtable reporting, where instead of getting uh, a written report, we get everybody sitting around the table to um, to say what happened. Um, in my, with my Todd hat on, we, we implemented that, and it was actually so much better in terms of trust and, and actually understanding the real impact than a written report, because people are much more open in person. But one thing I wanted to add to that is what we didn't do was it was an accountability for um, the organisations receiving funding. It would be super cool, and I don't know if anybody's doing this, if it was like a 360 degree accountability. So that um, the organisations funded were accountable to the funder and to each other, and the funder was accountable to each of the, 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 the people on, on, in that round table. And that might be uh, you know, one, a starter for um, a bit more reciprocal accountability. I like that concept, Kate, although I'm reminded of another truism of um, the funding world and that the, the funders' jokes are always funny. <laughs> Is anyone actually going to criticise the, <laughs> the funder? <laughs> Point taken. <laughs> We've got a great... Uh, another, um, another, sorry, just, uh, quickly, another saying that, uh, that I think is useful in this context, and it comes from the, the father of modern day accounting who was a um, Italian monk called Luca Piccoli um, the 14th century and um, he coined the the phrase that frequent accounting makes for lasting friendships uh, and I don't think he was just talking about debits and credits he was talking about regular contact and communication uh, is what oils smooth relationships uh, and to me it's always sort of struck me that um, it, Trust is actually a very human thing and it's a human relationship and I'll much more easily trust a person than I will an organisation. I think that's, uh, for me, that's the core of accountability and trust is it's around relationships as opposed to transactions. And we've got two, they're not questions, but they're comments that I just kind of like share to, to do a little bit of harvesting of your last thoughts. One's from David who says, perhaps trust is the perception in others that we hold ourselves accountable to standards that they value and support. Um, and the other one is from Sue, that is, Trust not built on demonstrating that you will do what you say you do consistently. 
So any last thoughts on trust, accountability, say, doing what you say you will do, that feels a bit like Dr. Zeus. These are both wise, wise quotes, I think. Mm. And I think trust isn't something you can do quickly. Um, like trust builds over time and perhaps trust builds through mutual accountability. Um, so, you know, over time you, 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 you get the experience of someone doing what they're saying they're going to do and uh, acting in good faith. Um, yeah, but it's not something, it's not something that you can just go like that and, and deserve it or achieve it. I was fortunate enough in the early 90s to spend a couple of years working in Japan and that taught me a lot about trust. Um, because Japanese business is hugely built on trust. And um, I had a, had a discussion with a, an executive in a Japanese corporation. And he couldn't understand how these American uh, potential partners could come to them and expect to have a meeting and just do business on the basis of a meeting. You know, to, to his mindset and his whole learning um, yeah, they could do business, but probably it'd be in a couple of years' time, and they'd probably need about ten meetings before then, because it was all about building a trusted relationship first, and then you could do business. And I just found that really, really interesting. It kind of sat me back at the time and made me think differently about relationships. And uh, you know, when I, I, I admire quite a lot of how the Japanese do business because when there is a business relationship, the level of trust uh, in that relationship is very strong and people will go the extra mile to make sure that the other party gets a good deal, that it's fair to both. Um, you know, it's not exclusively that case, but um, that was the, the main sort of philosophy behind it. And I thought that was very interesting. And the, and the other thing which I learned in Japan was, um, yeah, the 50 year view. Business plans that are, go out 50 years, not business plans that go out two years or five at a stretch. <laughs> um, it was about thinking beyond yourself. So just, just some reflections there. I guess that's one of the challenges with trusting government um, is that by definition they sort of have three-year horizons most of the time and I guess again if we can support politicians and um, in, in those who work for them to um, build bipartisan or multi-party um, consensus around issues we can perhaps tackle some of those big thorny issues that seem too hard, particularly in the political cycle, to do much of use about. Um, easier said than done. Uh, Norena, that's all we have time for today. I'd just like to thank Kate, Manu and Craig for your generous time, energy and contributions. Thank you to our attendees. Uh, for all of the great questions. We didn't get around to all of them, sorry. Um, but, you know, the words that I am taking away today are words like transparency um, and uh, mutual accountability. Um, and also uh, considering like being honest as a, as a learning process and, and reflecting on the value or uh, the contribution of honesty to trust and accountability as we build our relationships over time. Um, so this webinar uh, is part of a series on accountability and trust. And uh, we've got an article by Jane Ditblock on integrated reporting up on the website. And we'll be doing a podcast with the co-directors of the MACD Ahmed Institute, Professor Justin Hodgkiss and Associate Professor Nicola Gaston. Um, that will be next week. The webinar will be recorded and will uploaded to the website by the end of the week. So you're welcome to, to share it around. And coming up early next year, we'll be looking at the third theme and the final topic in our, our pro bono, um, which is value. 
So tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you all for watching today in uh, Kakiti. Goodbye. Okay.